How are we doing everyone? This is Dr. B. Today we're going to talk about some controversial topics regarding Native Americans, scalping, guerrilla warfare, and I'm going to address one of the most common stereotypes that Native Americans were these bloodthirsty savages who were looking Even in the Declaration of Independence, the United States government describes indigenous people as merciless Indian savages. The reality is, is that the overwhelming majority of indigenous societies were peaceful. In some Native American communities, they didn't even have a word for war in their language. Of course, prior to 1492, indigenous societies had disagreements. Some cases, those disagreements led to physical confrontations. This is part of our collective humanity. All human societies have conflict with one another, and Native Americans were no different. What we don't find here in the Americas are wars of extermination. You don't have situations where one indigenous community is looking to completely eradicate and destroy another indigenous community. You don't have the mass murder of women and children. So yes, Native American societies weren't these utopian places where everybody lived peacefully. There was conflict. In some cases, there was violence. However, violence was not widespread throughout the Americas. This is something that is brought to the Americas in 1492. Did Native Americans fight and resist the colonization of their homelands? Absolutely, 100%. Indigenous communities fought to defend their freedom, to defend their sovereignty. But when Europeans arrive here, they're typically met with love and compassion on the part of indigenous communities. That love and compassion that indigenous communities mostly demonstrated towards Europeans who arrived here quickly changes, obviously. I mean, when somebody comes to take your homeland, to take your children, to take your resources, to force you into a colonizer, colonized type of relationship, obviously you're going to fight back. Obviously you're going to resort to violence if it means that's the only way to remain free. What strategies did indigenous peoples utilize to defend their homelands from European colonizers? Well, guerrilla warfare is probably the most important military strategy that's used by indigenous people. European colonizers who arrive here quickly have to adapt to this type of warfare. In fact, the colonists utilize guerrilla warfare strategies that they learn from Native Americans and they employ these strategies against them. So British. remember, Native Americans did not line up in formation and go out into an open battlefield and go to war against their enemy. Native Americans used the land to their advantage. They used camouflage. Native Americans thought it was ridiculous when they saw these soldiers in bright red uniforms. Native Americans would blend into the environment. One colonist writes about indigenous warriors. He says, they come creeping on all fours from the hills like bears with their bows in their mouths. So Native Americans deploy and utilize these lightning fast military strikes against European colonizers. They hit their opponent fast. Remember, Native Americans are typically outnumbered by Europeans. And so when they utilize these methods, they're able to do a lot of damage. And after you hit your opponent hard, you move back into the environment. So these guerrilla warfare strategies become incredibly important for the defense of indigenous America. European settlers and colonizers really don't have any other choice but to utilize Native American guerrilla warfare tactics in an effort to subdue indigenous resistance. But in addition to utilizing Native American military strategies, they also utilize a scorch earth campaign against all indigenous peoples, including women and children. Of course, Native Americans are going to resort to violence to defend the women, the children, the elders, to defend the homelands. However, look at our weapon systems. Native Americans made bows and arrows to kill not other human beings, but to kill an animal. Our weapons were utilized mostly to feed our families. When Europeans come here, 
They bring with them a war machine. They bring with them weapons of mass destruction. They have steel, they have gunpowder, and these weapons are utilized to completely dismantle Native American freedom and sovereignty. Because of a lack of military technology, Native Americans really don't have any other choice but to resort to these military tactics of guerrilla warfare, they fight in a similar way that they hunt. They use camouflage. They blend into the environment. They strike when you don't know they're going to strike. They often fight the same way that they hunt. They utilize technique over technology. And this allows them to stave off European expansion and European colonization literally for decades. The complete takeover of the Americas by European settlers and colonizers literally takes decades. The war over this land also intensifies when indigenous peoples are able to acquire the horse. The horse is something that Native Americans did not utilize until Europeans arrived here because horses did not exist here. However, when Native Americans get their hands on the horse, the horse completely transforms indigenous military tactics. These indigenous warriors, especially those of the Great Plains, the buffalo hunters, the tribes that are living off the land, that are nomadic, become some of the greatest equestrians known to the world. We're talking about the Comanche, the Kiowa, the Plains Apache, the Lakota, the Cheyenne, the Blackfeet, the Assiniboine. These tribes of the Great Plains become a major roadblock to this idea of Western expansion and manifest destiny. Indigenous peoples also become incredible horse breeders as well. Not only are they capturing wild horses and utilizing them in their efforts to defend their homelands, they're also selectively breeding horses Horses like the Appaloosa, the Pinto, and the Paint. Because indigenous warriors on the Great Plains are incredibly successful in defending their homelands, the United States government employs, again, a scorch earth policy. You see incredible violence against indigenous women, children, and elderly. Really, nobody's off limits. You also see settlers who are encouraged to come out to the Great Plains with the sole purpose of killing the buffalo. The buffalo is the primary food source of Native Americans on the Great Plains. Not only is it a major food source, it's also a major source of all kinds of commodities that Native Americans utilize in everyday life. Settlers come out to the Great Plains and slaughter literally hundreds of thousands of bison in an effort to subdue the tribes of the Great Plains. Indigenous resistance to settler colonialism truly is historic. There's so many incredible Native American warriors who fought bravely to defend their homelands and their communities. Really too many to mention here, but I'm gonna talk about a few. You have Chief Joseph, he was Inez Pierce, who was credited for defeating the United States Army 13 out of 13 times. You also have Crazy Horse, a great military leader of the Lakota. He fought at the Battle of the Bighorn, one of the most famous battles between the Indians of the Great Plains and the United States Army. You also have Geronimo, who was Chiricahua Apache. He led a spirited resistance to Western expansion in Arizona territory. You also have Black Hawk, who was Sock Fox. Tecumseh, who was Shawnee, who fought the United States all the way up until his death. You have Captain Jack, who was a Modoc, who was credited for uh, being the only Native American to kill a United States general. You also have Osceola, who was Seminole. The Seminole have an incredible story of indigenous resistance. They're one of the few Native American nations to never truly be defeated by the United States. All right, so let's talk about scalping. This is a really complex issue, and scholars don't completely agree on whether or not scalping was known in the Americas prior to 1492. However, there is some evidence that Native Americans did engage in the practice. Nevertheless, it wasn't widespread. And what we do know is that things like headhunting is something that you find all over the world. So yes, some Native Americans 
did engage in the practice of headhunting and possibly even scalping. I know but like I said earlier in the video, most Native Americans didn't engage in any type of major military conflicts. It wasn't like violence was just widespread throughout the Americas. You don't see violence here in the Americas really until Europeans arrive in 1492. I know that has to disappoint some people, but the reality is this. All you have to do, again, look at our weapon systems. We don't have any major weapons of mass destruction here in the Americas. Yes, Native Americans fought. Yes, Native Americans engaged in warfare. Absolutely 100%. That's part of our collective humanity. I've already said that. But the reality is, is that violence that you see in the Americas doesn't really take off until European settlers attempt to wrestle the land away from Native Americans. We know that the Dutch were the first to offer bounties for scalps. We know that the war against the Wampanoag, also known as King Philip's War, that the British offered bounties for scalps. We also know that Americans scalped indigenous warriors during the Revolutionary War and after. It was really commonplace, not only for Native Americans to have their scalp taken by European settlers, but also to have the dead bodies of indigenous warriors, in some cases of indigenous women and children, to have those bodies mutilated. In many cases, European settlers would take war trophies by skinning the dead bodies of indigenous peoples. We also know that Andrew Jackson, AKA Old Hickory, who goes on to become the president of the United States, supervises the mutilation of the Red Stick Creek Indians. David Standard writes in his book, The American Holocaust, after the defeat, Andrew Jackson supervised the mutilation of 800 or so Creek Indian corpses, cutting off their noses to count and preserve a record of the dead, slicing long strips of flesh from their bodies to tan and turn into bridal reins." End quote. In addition, Methodist minister Colonel John Shivington, this is the guy who supervised the massacre at Sand Creek. This was a massacre of some 200 to 300 Southern Cheyenne. After the massacre, bodies were mutilated. Native American scalps were taken. In fact, there was a parade in downtown Denver, Colorado, and you had American soldiers who paraded through downtown with mutilated dead indigenous bodies on their person, including scalps. Shivington is quoted as saying, kill and scalp all little and big because nits make lice. Basically what he was saying, kill all of them, even the children. I'm just scratching the surface here. I can go on and on of stories of these horrific massacres committed by settlers. Remember, settler colonialism is an ugly structure. It's centered around this idea of genocide, this idea that you take what doesn't belong to you, that you confront the indigenous population with the idea of usurping their freedom, of destroying their sovereignty. This is what happened to indigenous communities throughout the Americas. However, the fight for indigenous freedom started in 1492 and it continues even today. I'm going to argue that this idea of indigenous resistance is still ongoing here in 2023. Native American warriors exist all over the Western Hemisphere. There's this ongoing fight to struggle against settler colonialism and this idea of American exceptionalism. I hope you got something from the video. If you did, please subscribe to the channel. Feel free to share and like as well. Until next time, peace.